Welcome to the Futures Edge podcast. I'm Jim Urio with, as always, a co-host and good friend and producer of the show, Bob Iacchino. And today we have Ryan Dietrich. Ryan Dietrich is the Chief Market Strategist at LPL Financial. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with his work, in my mind, it's really cool. It's like he's one of a kind because it's like a market historian that views historical trends and applies them to modern situations. Ryan, thank you for, for being here. I really appreciate it. Well, Jim, thank you. That was one of the nicer intros I've ever had. I present a lot, so maybe I'll just have you follow me around and you can give that intro. I will. I can do that. I can build you up. But before we go any further, too, and I know this is an awful day in the stock market. Every time I looked up, it seemed like it was down 20 or 30 handles in the S&P. But it is still Friday afternoon. We have, still have to have a little fun. We have to establish some credibility with you. So first off, here's the question. Dogs or cats? Well, I'm going to say dogs. Okay, good. So that's good. That's you're on the same page as me right away. Two, what's the best TV show you've watched over the last two years? Last two years. Wow. Don't make it some sort of highbrow thing. It's got to be silly. Well, I'll tell you, it's it, it ended more than two years ago, but I watched about a year ago, Banshee on Cinemax. You ever watched? It is. It was wow. like Sons of Anarchy, but it's on steroids. Banshee wow. from Cinemax. It's crazy. Really? It's really good. Okay, I got to really. write that down because I haven't uh, seen that. I don't know if you can tell, Ryan, but I kind of like top, Sons of violence, Anarchy. So. Violence, language, whatever it is, if you like Sons of Anarchy, it's X-rated Sons of Anarchy. So. Oh, yeah. Bobby thinks he's in an episode of Sons of Anarchy. I yeah, think. I don't know if you can tell, but i kind of a, a fan <laughs> of Sons of Anarchy. I have a motorcycle. Uh, one can dream. There you go. <laughs> okay, so let's let's get to it. So first of all, we're, the S&P just seems to be about down 13 or 14%. We're, we're um, testing those lows that we put in a couple months ago. Um, does this alarming to you? Can you give us some historical perspective on it? Yeah, it's been a rough year for sure, but I'm gonna share my screen here. Here's the big High question. tech stuff. Yeah, I know, did it work? Did it work across our fingers? Yeah, it sure did, yeah. Great. I love Zoom. I'll tell you, there's other ones out there that never seem to work as well. So anyway, but with that, you know, this year has been rough, but it's not over yet. But, you know, we've had a 13% peak to trough correction, Jim. The average year since 1980 corrects how much? 14%. Again, there's still more time, I'm aware. But, but just be aware that, you know, half the years since 1980 have seen at least a 10% peak to trough correction. We were spoiled, right? Last year, 30% up in stocks, only 5% are all year pullback all year. We said, hey, this year, 2022, will probably be a little bit more volatile. And sure enough, now we've got this pullback to about average, but the real kicker, when you look at all those previous years that had a 10% correction, there's 21 of them, at least since 1980, 12 of them finished the year higher and the average end of year return those 12 times was up 17%. Honestly, goodness, I don't think we're gonna finish up 17% where we are right now, but history would say, you know, Jim Carrey quote, you're telling me there's a chance. So just kind of put so some So you're telling right. me there's a chance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, but does the fact that over the last five years, I have to assume that that average has been um, skewed a little bit because we haven't seen many corrections in the last, I don't have my charts in front of me in the last five, to seven years. It does histor historically, if we avoid a correction for a long time, does that seem to make the correction worse once it comes? Yeah, it, it, it can. I mean, obviously, we got 2020 it's two years ago. That was a pretty big one last I checked. But, you know, the, the two years off that, obviously, oh, right. we're, we're, we're slim. Um, but, but you know, again, we're playing with averages, right? I mean, it's like the old saying about the statistician put his head in a bucket of ice and his feet in the oven. They said, how do you feel? He goes, well, on average, I feel pretty good. I mean, you can play with averages, you know. But, again, there's one 10% correction a year on average since 1950, but they come in bunches. Some years you have, like, none or one, and some years you have, like, four or five. So it's that joke about the statistician. But still, if you go for a while without one, sometimes it's it's rockier. And, and that's kind of what this year was. Guys, we were up over 100% you know, off those lows, as we all remember. It maybe just made sense that it was due. we were due for a break, due for a consolidation. I got some other charts and things we can talk about as we move forward that said this year could have just simply been one of those years is it the end of the bull market is it this or that i mean i guess it feels like the end of the bull market if you're in some of those previous high flying names but to us for the average investors that are still looking at this we think there's still a lot of time left and uh, this is just a year that maybe is going to be frustrating but that's kind of how things work sometimes do you think when you have to look to the fundamental reasons for it is the adjustment to a new interest rate policy the single biggest thing 
Yeah, that's right there. I mean, you know, it's been so long since we've hiked rates, right? There's like generations of investors that have never really had a higher rate cycle yet. I mean, I I don't know. I've never really seen a period of higher inflation. I was I was like born the last time we had inflation like this, you know. So <laughs> so it is it is an adjustment period. But you talk about adjustments. I mean, 2018, as people remember, the Fed hiked once a quarter, four times, once a quarter. And then they did that one hike, one one time too many, and the market got volatile in 2018, early 2019. In 2015, when they started that first hikes, uh, first rate hiking cycle, we saw that adjustment period in the early uh, January, early early February of 2016. So it's always that adjustment period. And what did John, Sir John Templeton say, right? This time is different. Those are the four most dangerous words. Every time kind of feels different, you know, but again, we've seen periods of rate hikes. We've seen periods of inflation, periods where market has to just kind of adjust to it all. And uh, sometimes market freaks out. And that's kind of clearly what we've seen this year. What gets me, and maybe Jim will ask you, I mean, I, I do, we have, by the way, as of last night, LPL cracked 20,000 advisors. So pretty cool. We had earnings last night. We cracked 20,000 advisors. I talked to advisors. Most people are okay with the fact bonds, I'm sorry, stocks have pulled back. It's the fact that bonds have had literally their worst start to year ever that's not helping a well-diversified portfolio. I mean, that, that makes it tougher, right? When bonds aren't participating, giving you that safety net. Yeah, no doubt. I think that at the beginning of the year, I took everything out and just bought the dollar against every other currency is what I wish I could say if I actually did something like that. <laughs> but of course, I did not. But um, let's ask a couple more questions before we're going to bring Bobby in for a couple questions as well. So uh, sell in May. Uh, I hate things like this. The sell in May and go away. Because mm -hmm. if everybody starts talking about it as a trader, I'm conditioned to be you know, somewhat uh, counter to what everyone else is talking about. So anytime someone talks about it, I say, you know, this is crap. It's not going to happen this time. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. What's the historical perspective on that? Yeah, I hope I hope I'm sharing it right now. And, and you are. It, it's it perfect. Is, yeah, good. It is one of those. It is what it is. Right. The worst six months of the year, indeed, May through Halloween. Um, and again, we're sharing on the screen there, broken down by all the different scenarios. Now, things aren't always that simple. I mean, that's the best way to put it. Check this next chart out if I can make it move. Hopefully, there we go. Should have moved. Uh, the last 10 years, <laughs> those worst six months where everybody's ready to just hide under their bed and, you know, go to cash and, you know, buy some gold bars. Um, the stocks have actually done really well. Okay. I mean, 15, and I, I kind of guess people give me a hard time on Twitter on this one. Coming into this month, the month of April for the S&P was up 15 of the past 16 years. That's pretty incredible. I don't know if ever in a month it's done that. Um, so maybe you could say April was due. And boy, we're getting hit pretty hard this April. Um, so this stuff isn't gospel. But but again, just I think it's something to be aware of. I love looking at history. You know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, said Mark Twain. I use that a lot. Um, but just be aware that, you know, you're going to hear a lot about Selma May go away. And it's been a terrible year. I mean, no doubt about it. We know that. But um, a funny thing about it is, you know, hey, Markets sometimes can start poorly and then they can actually come back to life. We think this one could do it. So we wouldn't say, let's just quite sell in May and just be aware. Sell in May go away has worked the last uh, nine of the last 10 years. So, ago. so but does it matter? Does it matter that the year has been trash up to this point for sell in May and go away? Is there is there data on that? Yeah, there is. I mean, if, if, if you're negative on the year, which... I think with about an hour to go, we're probably going to be negative on the year by the time this hits. Um, you know, yeah, you can actually get a little bit weaker performance, um, you know, in, in the seasonally weak period. But what gets us, um, you know, there the AAII sentiment number that just came out yesterday. I know it's only one poll. And I know it's like the same crotchety old guy sitting on their on their front porch that are in the poll. But the, the most bear since March 2009, right? At least bowl, three weeks in a row of less than 20% bowls. We haven't seen anything like that since I think like the late 80s. I mean, just astronomical. All these sentiment polls. The one that gets me though is put to call ratios. I know you guys are all over those. You know, the five day put to call ratio on a CBOE, that's high, but not as quite as high as we want. Maybe we get a big flush on. Friday, we're going to start to see some fear, but there's a lot of fear out there. And, you know, I grew up trading options for 11 years before I came into the money management side of things here with LPL. And when everyone's thinking, you know, everyone's thinking one thing, sometimes the opportunity is the other side. There's a lot of fear out there. So that inner contrarian in me, maybe the inner optimist in me just thinks, you know, maybe um, we could buck the trend and actually have a good six months during what's supposed to be a poor six months. And for, and for the people, before we bring Bobby in, to put a finer point on it, for some of you who might be watching, who aren't that sophisticated and new to this game. Guys like us look for a tons of put buying. If everybody expects 
the break and everybody buys the puts in anticipation of it, guess what happens? Well, not the break. Breaks really happen and are exacerbated by the fact that they catch people off guard. And if that happens, it's not catching anyone off guard. So we use that as a contraindicator when people are buying insurance. Uh, Bobby Aicino, do you want to come and join us? Let's just uh, do a little product placement here. I'm drinking out of my CME group water bottle. CME, nice. I have my CME, um, uh, I have my CME uh, coat here too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got a back. I don't, I don't have anything to share. I'm looking what I can share. I, I've got a cell phone. I, I don't have anything. So, you know you're what? I think you're sharing. You. I, had, I had some LPL Jersey Mike's for lunch. Everywhere. Yeah. There's my Jersey Mike's for lunch bag. That's, that's a Jersey Mike's promo. There you I'm go. Surprise each one of your lapels doesn't say LPL Financial. You got it everywhere. I love it. A yeah, um, couple of things real quick, if I could, Ryan. Um, first and foremost, do you struggle with the names of things? And I'll give you an example of what I mean. I have people over the years saying to me, well, are we in a recession? And I say, no. And they say, it feels like a recession. And I struggle all the time saying, what does a recession feel like? Like there's no, there's an actual, well, coming up when the three of us were coming up, I'm a little older than both of you, I think, but coming up a recession, when I learned it was two consecutive quarters of negative growth, they've since changed that to whatever the National Bureau of Economic Research says it is, right? But I still kind of go with that as sort of a barometer. We already had one of those. The other thing is a bear market. I learned a bear market was down 20% and you're out of a bear market when you reach a new high. So people say to me, well, the NASDAQ rallied today. Or, well, not today, obviously, but yesterday people like it rallied today. Are we out of the bear market? No, we're still in a bear market in the Russell and the NASDAQ, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, do you struggle with that? Or do you just throw those away and say, I need to make people understand that it may not be that bad? Yeah, I mean, I guess struggle with it a little bit because you're right. I mean, in 2001, we had a recession. It wasn't two consecutive quarters, the first quarter and the third quarter. Second quarter is pretty good growth, but they said, ah, we're going to change the rules on you because it's a recession. I mean, and let's be honest, the last recession we just had, the terrible one during the pandemic, I didn't, it hit everyone differently. I literally got a promotion in the middle of a pandemic. I was senior market strategist, got promoted to chief market strategist. The, the truth, LPL, we did okay during that pandemic. A lot of financial institutions did okay. My brother sells uh, GI Joes. He's got more GI Joes than anybody you know, by the way. He go, he wasn't going to the holiday Inn anymore, right? The, the, the shows on a weekend. So it wasn't your average recession. And I, 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 I feel for what you're saying there, but the whole bull market, bear market, let me get it. I got one cool chart here. Give me one sec, we'll pull this up. So here I'm going to share you guys all the different bull markets. And again, this is bull markets. We, we use the same lingo as everybody else. If it corrects 20%, the bull market's over. Well, in 2011, as most of us remember, we hit like 20% intraday in August 2011. In December of 2018, we darn near hit a 20% correction. So we say it was this 10-year bull market, yet there were really, really close situations where it wasn't. But still, you got to, you got to, you know, I guess you got to pick a number somewhere. But the thing I want to point out, um, building on this, this is year three of the bull market, right? I mean, we, we hit year, we're starting year three. Check out all the previous other times, year three. I look at that and sometimes there's sideways to choppy, right? Again, that's, we knew this coming into this year, year one and two, you get these big rallies. This is the best start to a new bull market ever, fast to hit 100% rally off to lows ever. Um, so what, there is some consolidation, some sideways choppy action, you know, frustrating, yeah. Is it normal and likely? Well, when I glance at what some of those previous best bulls did, years three and four sometimes are a catch your breath scenario um, as you go go higher. And we think that's, you know, pretty likely. And by the way, you know, bull markets, recessions, all this stuff, bear markets, um, you can have a bear market, that's 20%, again, you know, what the book says, during or with, without a recession. But the last time we had one was like 87. I mean, it's pretty darn rare. So our case is this, we don't see a recession. You know, we look at the fundamentals too. I sometimes make the joke, I'm, I look at market technicals as a trader, the F word, right? The F word is fundamentals. And if I'm talking to a fund of CFA crowd, the F word is Fibonacci. You can use that joke either way. Um, but, but still, the fundamentals are still there. So if you don't think you're going to have a recession, you know, a 10 to 15% correction this year makes a lot of sense. And that's about where it is, more with a mid-cycle slowdown, a la 94, 95, when the Fed hiked rates from 3% to 6%, really fast 94, did a number to the bond market, caused the uh, was Orange County to go under, caused the Mexican peso crisis. There were some problems in 94, early 95, but that was a mid-cycle slowdown, and then things kind of kept going. Again, that's kind of kind of how we see things maybe playing out. So year three, right. just be sideways and choppy. 
Ryan, it sounds to me like you're saying that people who are worried that it's the big one and people who I know you're we've established already that you're a little younger than Bobby and I, but in our career, and I think you're around too, we've seen just a monster uh, build up bubble twice and a monster implosion twice. You you're saying it sounds like to me um, that you're not seeing that and people could should kind of just maybe stay the course. But I will add one thing too before. And I noticed you gave me a tiny bit of a sarcastic jab, which I loved, which I said there wasn't a correction in the last five years. And you're like, yeah, if you don't count the 36 percent correction that happened yeah. in 20. I heard I was trying to be nice. <laughs> It's your podcast. I was trying to be nice to you. I was like, Jesus, I know, I know. But we will not tolerate niceness in any, in any way. I should have right. been slapped. But anyway, it sounds to me like you're saying it's not an enormous deal. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, you, you, you know, look at 2011, right? We saw, again, almost a 20% correction. Stocks are flat in 2011. Stocks are flat in 2015. They were down in 2018, yet they still went higher. We, we just are not of the opinion that this is the big one. I'll check one other cool chart. I think if I can get it here, here, check this out. So this is market sentiment. Love market sentiment. You guys have seen some of these, right? I mean, that magazine cover, last I checked, that doesn't look very bullish. You know, a bull stuck in the snow. I mean, that was a couple of months ago. That's uh, the, the uh, then you've got the, um, oh, was it Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Global Fund Manager Survey, huge amounts of cash, expectations on future growth really low. Um, you know, there's all these different things. If everybody's thinking like, you know, somebody isn't thinking, that's what Patton said. Everybody's thinking pretty bearishly right now. And again, terrible year for stocks, T worst start like ever for the Barclays ag. I mean, it's rough unless you got a bunch of commodities or the dollar, you know, it, it has been really, really rough. The headlines are terrible. We, we get all that. We're not ignoring the terrible things that have happened, you know, overseas and in, in, in uh, Ukraine with Russia and all that stuff. But markets are a forward-looking mechanism they price things in and boy guys it feels to us there's a lot of bad stuff priced in everyone says i was i was on tv this morning and they're like hey you know what could be the driver I told maria bartiromo this and i'll tell you guys now well, i like talking to you guys a little more she, she's got less tattoos i'm pretty sure um but but still you, <laughs> and you can say whatever words you want with us <laughs> hey, hey, well, I, I got hey you see these letters i gotta be i can't use bad words either i mean you know, but uh not oh, right right I, you I one wink, wink 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 but um we're in a world with like going with this guys i, I lost my train of thought what was i saying good Friday. good that's perfectly legitimate yeah. for this particular yeah. podcast um, really, i want to really talk about smart. inflation before we bring bobby back in um it was this okay is yeah. inflation how do stocks do in inflationary periods like this does it automatically mean that it has to be negative no, it doesn't. And that's actually the route I was going. So thanks for reminding me of that. You know, I mean, the, the truth is stocks historically have done pretty well in high inflationary periods. I mean, you know, that's the way it is. And the one driver that we think, is, although I know stocks haven't done that great in this environment. Well, yeah, I don't know. S&P's down, what, 14% from the highs in the midst of 40-year highs in inflation? Is that bad? Is that good? I mean, they're hanging in there, I guess. But the thing that we think is, you know, what could be the next driver to help stocks kind of continue the rally? It's the rollover in um, in inflation. And let me let me, let me get. I got to give me one second here. Uh, I know I've got it here somewhere, guys. It's a really good one if I can find it. Um, there it is. There it is. There it is. I'm gonna come back to you. Share screen. This is uh, usually I have two screens in front of me. There we go. Cool. So actually, I'll go to this other one first. Here we go. So this one, the, the, I love magazine covers, right? We've all heard the magazine cover indicator. You remember this one from, uh, and I, I'm a fan of Business Week. I'm not knocking. I'm just pointing it out. Is inflation dead in 2019? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I guess <laughs> the it short article. Time. <laughs> it's a, that, that dinosaur came back to life, right? It was like Jurassic Park. We brought it back or something. Um, you know, so, so clearly, but what are we hearing now? Everybody's worried about inflation because you're going to the pump, you're going to the gas station, all the stuff costs a lot more. We get all that. But one of the nice drivers is we think inflation is near a peak. A lot of people are saying that. You can talk to a two year old, they might think inflation could be near a peak, but it's like, how much further can it come down? I got two cool charts on the left that's used cars. I didn't really know this, but used cars. Uh, and trucks make up 4% of CPI. That's a lot. All right. They've soared. They were 45, up 45% year over year, two months ago. Used cars have really come back the last two months. On the right, I've got shipping um, from Shanghai to Rotterdam, LA, New York, down like 30%. If you see shipping coming down like that and you see used cars coming down, it's the old question. It's a, is it light at the end of the tunnel or is it a train coming at you? Because we've had a train come out a couple of times where we said inflation is going to start going lower. Then you have Delta, then you have, you know, Omicron, then you have the war uh, in Europe. All these things keep hitting. We think it could be light at the end of the tunnel that finally we could have a peak in inflation. What does that mean? Everyone's talking about the Fed hiking nine times. We would take the under on that, more like six or seven. Maybe that can give some relief. Yeah, we see 50 basis point hike next week and 50 basis point probably in June. But then the Fed can look.
look around, if we get some of this positive news on inflation, that could be the driver to help bring some confidence back and help equities the, um, the second half of uh, this year. Bobby, you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, so one, another question I get asked a lot is how do you respond to an inflationary environment? And, and we all know it's real estate and equities. Yeah. I mean, equities historically have done very well. People don't realize that inflation isn't just price inflation. It can also be asset inflation and usually is, right? Usually, not always. The times where it's not in the little bit of research I've done on it is during stagflation, which is inflation with stagnant growth. We just saw a negative GDP print. Now, I'm not asking you to time it. Your job is really the way I see your role. Maybe not. I mean, I've told people for years they need to follow you. Because to me, you're a, uh, you're a calming light, um, a life raft, so to speak, when people are panicking. All they got to do is go to your Twitter feed. And inevitably, when something bad is happening, Ryan is saying, you know, maybe it's not that bad. Look what happened in 17 of the last 23 and a half times. And that stuff's very calming to a lot of people. So I've told probably single digit to at least 10 people to follow you in the last week, Right. My question becomes then, we had a negative GDP, we had PCE today that missed by a tenth on the core, uh, came in a little stronger on the headline, month over month was was fairly strong. If the Fed is going to have success on inflation with what I believe is a mildly slowing economy, maybe not drastically slowing, but certainly could become that. Do we enter stagflation or not? And what is success for the Fed? We've talked about this in previous podcasts. Jimmy and I have talked about it personally. If they bring it down to four and a half percent, do we view that as good? Boy, this is the this is a sixty four thousand dollar question. But I will say thank you for uh, dropping my name and my Twitter handle there. I appreciate that. That's nice. Oh. Um, you know, but 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 yeah. I mean, we just hired a new a chief economist. Maybe let's put all this on him. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like any good strategist, we'll talk about somebody else's opinion. Um, what's that old saying, right? If you take it from one person, it's called stealing, but take it from everybody, it's called research. I think it's kind of how I've made a career doing this thing. But, I do um, research. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we're, we're of the op- opinion that by the end of this year, inflation can probably get back down to about 4%. And that is right. Is that a win for the Fed? Is it not? I mean, the Fed is the dual mandate, right? Keep the economy strong, specifically employment, and keep prices under control. Well, they probably were behind the eight ball, which they should have hiked rates probably last year few times to try to get the to get out in front of this inflation they didn't it is what it is we are where we are um you know and again i i like to we like to say is it a recession is it not i mean if we go to recession that means the fed probably screwed up they don't really want us to go into recession i don't believe if you look at what uh, jerome powell said last march he didn't think we're in a recession at all you know we like to look at spreads right and uh, the, the smartest guys in the room right at the bond market yeah maybe sometimes um you know credit spreads on investment grade uh, corporates and high yield and swaps and things those spreads have come up a little bit but they're not anywhere near you know uh, panic levels that we've that we've seen before so those are the kind of some of the things that we like to watch every day i've got one other chart i want to share here just kind of the lines of seasonality. I mean, so the Fed, we can talk about the Fed all we want, but this year was probably due to be a little rocky and frustrating. And we can talk about the headlines. I, I get inflation and all the things, but this has broken up all 16 quarters of a four-year presidential cycle. Well, <laughs> you can see the one that's uh, where we are now. You know, we're literally in the middle of the worst quarter out of 16. The second quarter, the second year of a new president, of a president in general, presidential cycle, is the worst quarter. First quarter, third quarter, not too great either. You get to the fourth quarter next year, ooh, that's when the good stuff comes. You know, on average, you see a 17% peak to trough correction in a midterm year. So again, maybe we were, that's the most, by the way, out of the four-year cycle. And no one knows when the low is going to be. I get it. As of, like, think this second, it's May 8th. I'm sorry, May. May is the future. March 8th. You know, we might break that, but that was the low. The average low in a midterm year is August 14th. So one thing that worries me a little bit, midterm years usually don't bottom until later in the summer. But one year off those lows, stocks are up 32% on average. So again, we knew coming into this year, we probably do for volatility. We probably do for a pullback. Bear market? I don't think by bear market because I don't see a recession. But close, maybe. And that's kind of what's playing out. So it's it's really interesting how, you know, these cycles and these things, all the headlines are always different, but markets have been doing this stuff for a long time. And midterm years are rough and <laughs> it's played out again. But again, maybe so, a year from now will be a lot higher. 
So, Ryan, I, I think it was your it might not have been your piece. I was reading a piece yesterday that said about midterm election years and mirrored all the things that you said, too, and then said it begins to accelerate in October. Um, you know, once it bottoms in August, is that the way you see it as well, too? Does it seem to gain acceleration? That is, that is, I'm trying to see if I've got the chart here. I don't, I guess I don't. That is exactly correct. I mean, it, it, right around the, it's all about the election. I mean, you know, we all, we've done it long enough. I mean, markets hate uncertainty. I don't know. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. We talk about it, but there is uncertainty around these elections. And once you get closer to the election, then, then, then clarity can come. And that's exactly when it's usually around the middle of October that the, that the, the, the rocket ship starts taking off. Like maybe it's because of my birthday in late October, but maybe not. But, um, you know, that's usually when the strength. Sure. It is. Yeah. Continue. yeah, it probably is. Yeah, that was a fun stat. So my birthday is actually October 28th. And if you went back in history, that was literally the, like the strongest day of the year in terms of average returns. So I was tweeting that out and doing it all like I think it was two years ago. Like USA Today picked it up saying, oh, October 28th, the strongest <laughs> day of the year. It, we got lit up something terrible. I think it was like right before the election, actually. Some election news came out or something. And you know, I was like, ah, oh. anyway, but um, <laughs> it doesn't work every time. Yeah. Half of it, they can't take a joke. Okay. Well, last question for me is rate hikes. I mean, we're getting plenty of them. Um, there's, you know, just tons of historical data on how equity markets do when the Fed is hiking rates. I personally will argue that this time it's more important because I believed that part of the 10 year rally was on uh, inorganically held low rates. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, you know, let me get my, I'll get one screen here for you. Here you go. I think it's this one. So I'll talk about it in a second. Think about this. The Fed did 17 rate hikes in 2000. It was uh, 2004, 5, and 6. 17. 17 rate hikes. Stocks were up all three of those years. Not by a lot. OK, it's like single digit, single digit, uh, low double digit returns, but they were higher. And this is the data that a lot of people have shared. I've shared it. This is what happens after the first rate hike historically. Um, you know, going back to the early 80s, 12 months later, you're higher. Usually, you know, most of the 80, 88 percent of the time, some of those returns aren't spectacular. Our take is this. When the Fed starts hiking, it's taking off the training wheel. So get ready for some volatility. But also you're more mid cycle. I mean, you, you, you usually have um, I think it's like 30 percent gains on average average from the first time the Fed hikes, the first hike until the Fed, until the S&P peaks, like 17 months later. I mean, again, every time is different. You know, I, I get all that stuff, but usually it's just like the shot clock has started, but it's not a 24 second shot clock. It's, it's like a 45 second shot clock back in the old times, old days. So there's still some time. And again, it's just more normalcy taking off those training wheels. Um, you know, the Fed, we can go around in circles on them all day. I mean, yeah, they were behind the eight ball. Yeah, there's an aggressive, aggressive stance coming. Um, but again, I, I love the market sentiment part of it. And if everybody's thinking about nine rate hikes, I just think we're going to take the under on that and market's going to price these things in. And that could be a positive. I mean, I hate to get political, but it is what it is. You know, is the Fed going to continue to hike rates as we get closer to the actual election? They might do a lot of hikes now, you know, but the pre-election year, next year things, historically, they don't hike as much then. And the Fed is supposed to be separate from the White House. I, I understand that. I don't know if it's ever quite that simple. So, you know, they're, they're going to do what they do now. And I think they'll look around and do less than nine. And that could be a positive when all said and done. As, as you were answering the question, I was thinking to myself, was there ever a time in my life where I wasn't so jaded and evil and awful like I am now and was more like you. And I was like, you say, we can go round and round about the Fed. No, I want to point a finger at the Fed and say, you guys were absolute politically motivated dipshits by not tightening and stopping your bond purchases a year ago when everybody was screaming at you to stop buying bonds. Um, yeah. I'm going to soften that question for you a lot, but you've alluded to it a couple of times. It seemed pretty clear yeah. That the Fed should have started, you know, eight months at the a bare minimum before yeah. they did, including buying 40 billion of, of mortgage backs into the teeth of a, a hugely red hot housing market. What in the world were they thinking? Are they incompetent? Oh, I don't think I'm going to go say they're incompetent. I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> trying to get me in trouble here, Jim. Come on. You're, you're yeah. trying to get me in trouble. No, but, I'm uh, not. I won't get you in trouble. I, I, yeah. I know. Yeah. But, but I mean, I, I really think, you know, they had the best intentions. But then Omicron happened, and then all the shutdowns happened, then all the chip shortages happened, and then the war happened, and all the inflation. So the, there's always one-off events. We, we get it. We've been hit by a 100-year pandemic, which kicked it all off, right? I and mean, we've been hit by some things. But at the end of the day, I think the Fed, I mean, I, I kind of like Jerome Powell. The guy's on like 60 minutes every time I turn around. Seems very straightforward. You know, I mean, what's the quote by Greenspan? I'm going to butcher it, but it's something along the lines of, you know, if you understand what I just said, then you misunderstood what I said. You know, it's something like that. Greenspan used the 
bunch of big words and you didn't know what he just said over an hour. I think he really appreciated that. He liked to confuse you but not say anything. Uh, Powell doesn't feel that way. He really said, hey, employment, I'm going to try to get this economy going after a terrible recession. We're going to get the economy going. We're going to get jobs back. He did. And then the pivot happened in November. Maybe they should have done the pivot sooner. I mean, he probably would admit that, you know, over a few drinks if you got it, got him to it to do it. But then well, now then you'd admit I, that over a few drinks too, right? There, there you go. There you go. But yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it, it's tricky, Um, you know, but he got the hawks out there and this and that. It's uh, at the end of the day, it's what Jerome Powell says. He's the one really driving the bus, so to speak. So I still think, you know, he, we're, we're just not going to see nine hikes. Bobby, you got anything more for Ryan so we don't eat up his whole Friday afternoon? Yeah, that uh, last chart you just showed, Ryan, mm -hmm. I remember that one when you put it up on Twitter a while back, and I actually grabbed it, and that's the one I did some research on where I saw that some of the, the three worst performing uh, years in terms of the equities were years with either flat or lower GDP. So it was, it's not technically stagflation, yeah. but it's basically what you said when you look at um, – the Fed rate hikes going into economies that were slower, those provided the three worst returns here on your chart. There's actually, I, I added jetty, GDP into these years to okay. see kind of where it went. And, and GDP was either flat or lower. So that'd be something that if somebody is a stock timer, which we're not recommending nor discouraging, that's not our job. Um, that's probably what you want to keep an eye on in the midst of the inflationary cycle and the rate hikes is whether GDP is um, has any momentum or not. And it's a strange thing because we've never seen this before coming out of a pandemic, now coming out of coming out of a pandemic. And then yeah. supply chain issues. It was interesting to see the chip shortage time actually go up last month, um, but it might be tapering off now. So I guess it leads me to my last question because a couple of years back, let's say three years back, the question that turned out to be, that a lot of people said yes to, turned out to be no. That question was, is stock picking dead? Now the question becomes, and this is, I think in your wheelhouse, is 60-40 dead? Yeah. Um, oh boy. Yeah. Probably not, we, we, right? Just like yeah, stock. I'd say, I'd say, you know, we've been under, put it this way, we manage about $75 billion, maybe a little less after today. Um, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not we'll see. Anyway, um, yeah, we've been underweight bonds. We've been saying for a while, you know, ah, we think yields are going to go higher. Look at commodities going higher. There's some reasons, you know, copper goes up. Sometimes 10-year yield follows it. So we've been saying, you know, go to your floating rate, go to your shorter term uh, duration, it, uh, try to outright avoid treasuries it, potentially, unless you really can't. Um, so so it made sense to us that we've been like 63, 37 in some of our portfolios um, recently. Now, I will say this, and it's similar to kind of some of the concepts we just talked about. I mean, bonds are like having their worst start to a year ever. People are kind of getting realizing, oh my God, so bonds don't like always go up or they don't always provide security when, when equities go down. I mean, a lot of us, including me, I think to a degree are realizing, oh, I guess it doesn't always do that. But again, we think maybe, you know, the yields have had such an extreme move, look like two year rate of change and 10 year thing like that. It is as extreme as it gets. We're thinking about potentially adding a little duration. So just the fact that we're even talking about, should we get rid of 60, 40 portfolios? Maybe you should this. say we shouldn't. Do not ever forget the this. greatest magazine cover I've ever seen, Time magazine in 2009 said should we retire the 401k time magazine said that i remember looking at that saying whoa and that's off the lows i mean mark was up a ton off those lows i mean in 2009 thinking oh maybe we shouldn't that was like a buy signal of all buy signals so you know i i think you know these things go in cycles but an investor should still an average investor should probably still think about being diversified and bonds can do that especially after the move we've seen that's a fantastic answer <laughs> really, the more they ask Friday it. afternoon, I'll, I'll tell you what, I can't believe I can't pull it off. Enthusiastic. Remember, remember, yeah, I was, I was all at, charged up. Remember old school? Remember old school when he like leaves his body and he gives that great answer? Um, um, <laughs> yeah, that was it. I just did that. I just did that where I have no idea yes. what I just said. but yeah. Yeah. It was beautiful, though. It was poetic. That's going to be our clip. The one with the great rant. Ryan, tell people where they can follow you on Twitter, please. And guys, follow him on Twitter, particularly for what Bobby said, too. He always gives the calm, the calm, level-headed response. The voice of reason. Okay. I've been told I have a voice for radio, so or face for radio, sorry, face for radio. <laughs> anyway, at Ryan Dietrich, R-Y-A-N-D-E-T-R-I-C-K, then LPLresearch.com is our blog. And we have a YouTube channel where you can see, see a lot of stuff, too. LPL Research YouTube. Those are kind of three places you can... Uh, you can see a lot of things that I'm doing along with the rest of our nearly 30 person research team. Thank you so much, Ryan. This was fun guys. I look forward to another yeah. one. Have a great cool. weekend.
And now Bobby and I talk about trades. If uh, okay. And Ryan, you feel free. Hang up if you want. Stay with us. If you want to interject anything else, uh, shoot in. Because this, uh, this is the part where it gets to the nuts and bolts. And I looked at Bobby's trade first. And uh, I see that it's a, a negative equity trade. Bobby, what's your thesis? Yeah, it is a negative equity, tra equity trade. Again, this is for the more active, likely futures trader. Um, I like the idea of getting short depending on where we close today. And that's really the key part to the thesis. It has a lot to do with when we close today. And unfortunately, I probably have to jump the gun on this one because as I'm looking at the chart right now, again, we record on Friday afternoon, the market is not yet closed. Uh, we're pretty close to where I need it to close. So if it closes below, and this is the S&P, and I'm gonna do the micro because it's a little bit bigger of a trade. If we close below 41.78, on the June contract, I wanna be short it. And this is a short term short. And this is something just based off of, there's a particular indicator called the R zone. It's not actually an indicator, it's a proprietary use of moving averages. We don't trade moving average crosses because they're just horrendous, they're horrible. But what you can do, and we've done about 35 years of research into these in different markets, if you have a certain set of moving averages, they provide you with a rotation zone. So what markets tend to do short term is they'll break down, the moving averages will cross, those averages will not only angle down, but they'll start to widen. And we call this a first cross. So when we get that first cross, then we get to move up into it. You can fade that often. And if you fade it in the right way and have the right targets, the trade tends to work out about 71.3% of the time. Now, about just about 71.3%. Approximately 71.3%. That's, <laughs> by the way, that's over the last 10 years. And a lot of those have been long trades. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but I want to sell it. And I'm going to go ahead and put my sell entry at 4172.75. That gives me a wide swath. What I'm saying is sell it around 4177.75 or, or you know, anywhere below that up to 4172.75. So I'm going to put my entry at 4172.75. My stop on that's going to be 4253.25. That's about $402.50 of risk on one micro S&P contract to make about $742.50 at a target of about 4024.25. I actually think we can get lower than that, than that, but I don't want to screw with that even 4000 level and, and all that comes with that mess. So it's going to be about a 1.85 reward to risk. So here's what I love about the trade. First of all, I've been screaming bearish for, you know, for weeks and weeks. I've been talking about it. I, I do think we're going to 20% correction when it's all said and done. And that's when I think the Fed could maybe blink their eyes a little bit. And talking to Ryan, I, I love talking to very, very smart guys, it's particularly when they come into conflict with what my opinion is. And there's some things I said, he said that I really, really agree with. But on the short term, I definitely think uh, negative too. And the, the one thing I like about this trade a lot is when you talk about using the micros, um, you can widen things out, particularly if you're a new trader or you know you don't have tons of deep pockets and not have to sweat through the full size contract, which is ten times bigger than that contract. So if you're if you and I like the wide trades more, a trade that might you anticipate having this trade on for a week possibly, right? Yeah, a week to week to ten days at the most. Um, right. I don't think it would take much longer for that to happen because if we break down on the S&P, the S&P has lagged the NASDAQ in terms of the downside. It's lagged the Russell in terms of the downside. So if we break down on the S&P, it's likely catching up. So that's actually part of the reason I picked that rather than the NASDAQ or the Russell. But are you on the same page as me is that most of what we are seeing in the weakness is an adjustment to a new rate world? Yes. I mean, it's funny because we were talking to Ryan and, and like I said, Ryan to me has been the voice of reason for years. He doesn't even know that I've been watching his Twitter for that. But I have a very wealthy client who's texting me while we're talking here. Right. And he is an active trader, but loves to find places to put on longer term trades. Should I buy Amazon here? I'm not looking at Amazon. Yes. You know, should I buy Apple here? Yes. Because I know what he's asking me. He's asking me, should I buy Amazon for a five year hold? Of course. Should I buy Apple for a five-year-old? Of course, I'm going to have this short on for anywhere from seven to 10 days. Right, but the big difference, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I, I like it. I'm with you on that too. And before I give my trade too, I will. I do like, we like to talk about the trades we've done in the past. I had two trades on from, oh, yeah. uh, from the last one on. Absolute disasters, by the way. Both Same of mine were. Yeah, which by the way, that happens. That's one of the reasons we set up trades 
um, where we lose less than we'll make. You know, yet sometimes, you know, if, you, if we, if I could make money on, let's say, 45% of my trades, I would, you know, be successful. So sometimes you lose. One of the reasons I use the micros um, is because I don't have to sweat it as much. Because, you know, you look, if you got your trade on in the bigs and all of a sudden it's going against you and you're seeing losses mounting, all of a sudden you're thinking, wow, this game is keeps me up at night. It's not as much fun anymore. So, uh, so yeah, my trades have been a disaster. So that means I'm due. Like when I was a basketball player, if I had missed three jump shots in a row, I'm due. If I had made three jump shots in a row, I was hot. Either way, I was taking that next shot. But uh, here we go. So I want to talk about the dollar because I think the dollar is the most underreported story right now. It started in the first week of March when the yen absolutely collapsed to the tune of 11.5%. Um, I don't know if you know who Brent Johnson is. His Twitter handle is Santiago Capital. He's been talking about the dollar milkshake was what he called it. And when he said, when all this has happened and all the, um, the central banks creating currencies around the world, the dollar is just going to grind them all up and they're all going to go to crap. And he's, so far, he's been right. The euro has seemed to follow recently. Um, first of all, before I even get into the trade, do you think it's alarming the way the dollar moves? And do you think this, the, the Fed is can pivot based on the dollar strength at any time? You know, it's funny. I am 100% right in hindsight um, all the time. And this was one of the things that the dollar was one that I was actually right in foresight. I just kept looking at just from the rate scenario. And I didn't do any trade specifically. I did buy some uh, um, some dollar versus the yen. I did do that. I shorted the yen futures, but I didn't do anything in the euro. I did some shorting of the pound, but covered those right away. The ECB is in a horrendous position, in my opinion given that their, A, their economy is most affected in terms of G7 by Russia, Ukraine, just drastically affected, right? Germany, especially. And that's obviously the engine of the EU economy. And the ECB is in a position where they have rising inflation and really can't fight it, given what they're under with, again, not only their, their normal lag of the US economy, which we've seen, they came out of COVID later, they went into COVID later, came out of COVID later. And then they've also got the economic hangover that they're going to have, whatever that turns out to be, none of us know, with Russia, Ukraine. So I liked the dollar. It was just a matter of what I liked it against. Obviously, the, the Bank of Japan doubled down on yield curve control. We've got now our first evidence of what yield curve control is going to look like. They're essentially buying assets to protect that 25 basis point upper band on the JGB. So that's interesting. So looking at it from a perspective of the euro, yeah, I'll sell most rallies until Christine Lagarde tells me that's a bad idea. And so far, she's not doing that. Well, my, my trade is going to be counter trend. And one of the reasons I like this trade, it was for technical analysis, it looked like it was bottoming. And there is absolutely nothing that I can see that supports the euro. That's why I'm buying the euro. To Bobby, that might make a little bit of sense. I know to most of you are scratching your head going, why? Um, it just seems like a lot of bad was priced in. And I think there, there may come a time where the Fed becomes a little bit alarmed with the dollar strength. I mean, we, we, I like a strong dollar. You know, uh, Larry Kudlow, you know, with his whole king dollar thing, I generally agree with that. But the, the slope has been so steep and so aggressive that I think that it's potential for a pullback. So here's the trade, and then you tell me why, why I'm so wrong. Um, I have this all set up, and I might even be in now because it's a stop in trade. This is also counterintuitive to people. When I left my desk, the, the euro was trading just below one spot 06. My buy in stop on the June micro is one spot 0610, just above a kind of a psychological level of 06. And the target is 1.0780. Now, the reason I picked that is it's just below. 108 was a support level for a couple months. The euro, it fought, it fought, it fought, and then it gave a couple of weeks ago. And that's when the euro spilled out of bed. This is the bounce back retest trade. It doesn't mean to me that the euro is saved. I just think that there's a lot of short positions in it that could potentially get out if it starts to move past those levels. My stop is below at one spot, 0490. So this trade is in the June micro euros. If it hits its target, it makes $212.50 per one lot. And if it gets stopped out, it moves 100, it, uh, you lose 150 bucks per one lot. Do, is there anything that you can say that you don't hate about this trade? <laughs> I actually don't hate the trade. And I just mentioned that rotation zone, which is something we use for entries, right? And one of the, the components of the rotation zone is uh, something we call eight pushing the price. And it's when the shorter term exponential moving average is actually pushing the price down. A lot of the times the price will break away from that eight and then move back to it. That is the only thing I don't like about your trade. I think your target is 
um, a little high, but I know you and I know that you use trailing stops and I know that you also, you know, if the trade weakens, you'll take it off at a profit. So uh, I like you having this trade. Uh, I'm not sure if I would like some of our viewers putting this trade on and waiting till next Friday to find out that uh, you got out earlier because obviously we won't be able to talk to them unless they follow you on Twitter, which they should. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before we go on about this, I got smoked on my RBOB trade the second I put it on last week. So I want to so point I that out. When we lose on trades, we want people to know that, you know, we take our licks and that's it. Yep. I guess I shouldn't say licks after talking about Ryan's deck. I said deck. <laughs> You said right. deck. I heard you say deck. It was Ryan's deck. Got a little confusing. I've seen Ryan's deck, his PowerPoint, his deck. Exactly. We're not talking about anything else. We're not even any anyway. Um, so back to, to oil. You, you mentioned our Bob for a second there. Crude is still tightening yeah. in that pennant, tightening in that pennant. Tell me what's going to happen in crude. So I'm not I'm not looking at a crude trade for part of the reason because I, I think the crude oil is consolidating. There's a lot going on on the fundamental side, not the least of which. Rig counts continue to go up. I've, we're either up or flat on rig counts now, 27 weeks in a row. So U.S. supply, while not increasing exponentially versus the way the rig counts are increasing, is starting to fill that gap. But we still have the, the Ukraine-Russia conflict going on, which means fewer and fewer barrels are coming on the market. Somebody I talked to told me that China, and th this is a trusted source, China is starting to pull away from Russia in terms of buying their crude. They're buying more crude from Iran now, which again, I don't think the US would necessarily love, uh, but it's way worse for Russia. So that means more of Russian supply is off the market. So crude is doing what crude does. It's consolidating until there is a clear supply and demand disruption, which we don't have yet. So I don't have a trade here. It could be going sideways. I mentioned this um, in a TV spot I did the other day. Right now, if you go all the way back to March 14th, we had a 26% range in crude oil contract to a 16% range in crude oil contract to now about a 9% range in crude oil and all in guess how much the difference between the March 14th closes to now 1.9% right? that's yeah. it it's crazy so you know my partner mike arnold does this thing called candlestick math where he takes all of the candlesticks of a chart compresses them together to show people that and kind of goes to what Ryan says a lot of time, I think, that this stuff happens and yet not much has changed. And that's stuff that people kind of need to get used to, especially if you're gonna be trading futures. That's why I like the micro so much because you can actually play some of that stuff without taking this massive, massive risk. No doubt about it. Now, I, I just back to crude for me and I see that, that um, winding and I keep saying that I think if it trades above it, because generally those things resolve themselves in the way they came, I think we could shoot higher again up to the 125 area if we trade 108. You know, it's a it's a broad trade. If I put that on, it'll be in micros or in options because I'm not going to, you know, buy a couple thousand barrels of the bigs and try that. But uh, I think you could have to. And one more <laughs> yeah. point before we go, will you make, I remember you made it the other day. You said Russian crude off the market, but it's not really off the market. It's just going to different places and the supply chains are not, mature in those areas to handle it. And that's really more of what happens. The net net amount of crude is still going to stay the same. It's just they're yeah. going to be sent it to different places and you know the world goes round. Well, it's interesting because the number I heard was 34%. So that 34% means China's buying 34% less crude from Russia than they did last month. Now, that may amount to 800,000 barrels. I don't know because you don't get a whole lot of transparency between Russia and China, right? Right. Um, so we don't know what that number is, but yeah, it's going to sit in Russian tankers is what's happening. Also, from a perspective of, of crude oil going to Europe from the U.S., in February, I'm sorry, March, 1.4 million barrels on average per tanker, that's up from 1 million. So that means a couple of 2 million barrel, ta uh, gallon ta I'm sorry, it's barrel, 2 million barrel tankers have gone to Europe, which normally they're 1 million barrel tankers. That's something else that I heard. Back to my RBOB trade. Had I not got stopped out, we already hit my target. I'm just looking at that now, but I got stopped. Out. So yeah. the direction yeah. of the trade was correct. You manage your risk for that reason. I got stopped sure. out. It was wrong. It, it is what it is. I got in too early. Sure. And if you can't, I mean, we, we trade, you know, again, we don't expect to make money. What do you think of yields? We hope to make money. Trade. What do you think of yields? Um, <laughs> you don't I don't have a trade, so I, but you have I know, I know. And I, I got kind of whacked before. 
I actually think there could be a pullback. I, I think the the um, the front end. I'm still I think still think yields are going to rise a little higher. I think twos and tens are going to go test zero again. You know, twos versus tens. Um, I think ultimately we probably still after we correct a little bit still move higher. I think at the end of the day, short end rates are going to be about. Uh, three and a half percent. I think ten year will be just a little higher than that, and that's I'm I'm projecting out to the end of summer when that's when I think the Fed begins to pivot and say we've done enough and we see a neutral rate or whatever we're going to say. So right now I think yields go down a little bit. In a couple of weeks I think they resume higher. That makes sense. Yeah, it does absolutely. Yeah. All right. What else you got? We're done. We are done. Okay. Have a good weekend, my friend. You too, buddy. Thanks again to Ryan. <laughs> yeah, he was great. Thanks. Yeah.